Uh, my name is Bruce Barnes. I'm doing the walking tours for the Preservation Society. Um, I've been a member for, of the Society for a long time, lived in New Bedford for a long time, done a lot of studying in New Bedford. And uh, it's really my pleasure, really, to do these tours every, every month for, uh, for them. Um, tonight we're doing a, the houses that basically are on the site of the original James Arnold property. James Arnold, whose house is here, uh, it was modified a couple of times, but his basic house is, is the big the square two-story here. He moved into the site in 1819, and he purchased approximately 11 acres, basically bound by Union, Arnold, County, and, co and uh, Cottage. That's the, that was his site. All the houses we're seeing tonight are going to be, um, except for two, which are just, just outside his property, uh, were developed um, in the 1890s and so when, his, when uh, the daughters of one of the, the latter owners of the property decide to, decided to uh, subdivide the, pl the place and put more housing in. Now at the time when these houses were built, mostly in the 1890s, early 1900, the textile industry was booming and there was a real shortage of property for executive houses that was relatively close to downtown. And this is all most of these houses built prior to the automobile, so the people who bought the houses and worked in the city as executives needed to be fairly close to, to the, their businesses, their banks, their, their mills, and so forth. So that's the reason why there was a crunch, a real estate crunch, and why so many of the houses we're going to see tonight, beautiful big mansions, every house we're going to see tonight is really gorgeous. I mean, you could say that, you know, you, you could look at one and say, boy, this is my favorite, and you go to the next one and say, wait a minute, that might be my favorite. All of them are beautiful buildings, um, and we're going to see a, a number of them. We're going to walk by quite a few, actually, that are nice that I'm not going to talk about. But nonetheless, this is going to be a very interesting tour because all of the properties are really quite beautiful. This is the first house on the tour tonight. Very, very unusual uh, use of field stone. Rubble stone, sometimes they call the siding on this house. Um, all the houses on the tour tonight are from the colonial revival period, which means they were houses that were um, inspired by the, the earliest houses in, in America. Now, this Gambrel style house um, was unique in in the colonial period, the Gambrel style house was unique to our area. It wasn't, you know, it was, there were plentiful uh, Gambrels in other top parts of, the, of New England and, and New York and so forth. But our, the South Coast here has a nice collection of them. And so this house here, which was built in 1896, is a beautiful, except blown up example of the colonial Gambrel style that was really farmhouse style that was popular in, in, in the South Coast from Swansea to Wareham and every place in between during the colonial period uh, as a farmhouse. Now this particular building is very unique and quite beautiful really. Um, it's, it has this fabulous <laughs> large stone siding. Uh, this, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of rubble stone houses. I think there's one on Russell's Mills Road, actually. I think it's a, uh, it's a uh, craftsman style. There's a couple of other buildings you'll see that have rubble stone. But look at the size of the stones on this house. I mean, really, the, the, the legend goes that the, the siding was from a, a farm field and a cushionet. Who knows if that's true or not? Because there were was, there was stone walls even in New Bedford at this time. The architect of this house was named um, Edgar Hammond. And Edgar Hammond was, uh, and his father Caleb, were very important early architect, not early, but they started in the Victorian, late Victorian era, and Edgar uh, took over the business uh, and the design business uh, around 1880. Um, I've talked about Hammond on other tours, the big Duff house, the big Duff office building across the, directly across the street from City Hall is the Edgar Hammond building. Um, he was a very, very influential architect. The, uh, the, uh, yacht Club in Payton Aram, the New Bedford Yacht Club in Payton Aram, Edgar Hammond. So he has houses sprinkled throughout this area, but this is really one of his most recognizable um, commissions. Um, I have not been in this house, but the former um, administrator of the Preservation Society lived in this house for a short time. Her, her in-laws, 
um, owned the house for, for a brief time in, in the 50s and 60s. So she's very familiar with the house. Said so it's nice on the inside, but although I haven't been in it, it was on one of our, I think it was one of our house and garden tours when we had those years ago. But other than that, uh, this house hasn't been open to, for us for, the, for any of the other tours. Very nice building. The green paint is very, very authentic. Um, it still has its original slate roof. Now this house dates from 1896. So the roof is over, well over 125 years old. Um, so just a beautiful building. All the buildings on this on Arnold Place were built, and almost all of them were built around 1896, 1897. This is before the automobile became uh, very, very popular. There were automobiles in Bedford during that time, but not very many. And it was it was still kind of suspect that, that actually that the, they would the horseless carriage would actually make it. Five years later, that all changed. Everybody wanted an automobile very quickly, and by the middle, you know, by like even uh, 1905. Everybody needed a car uh, that had, they could afford one, or multiple cars often. This is a nice shingle style house, colonial style with a gambrel roof. Actually has an intersecting gambrels, kind of a common style. The reason I included this house on the tour tonight, because this is another house by Nat Smith. We did a whole tour, uh, some, of, some of you may have gone on the, the first tour of the season, we, and I did um, all, a number of houses by Nat Smith, and this is, this is one of them. 1896. Um, he, he did another house similar to this and in the, almost the same color. It's a cream color house now on Hawthorne Street between uh, uh, Page and um, Ash. You go by it, it's on the left, it's on the left hand side and you'll see um, a house that's similar to this, similar colors and that's another house by Smith as well. Matter of fact we kind of identified the house because of certain details about that house that is similar to this one. Anyway um, again, uh, typical of the shingle style that was built in the, 18, in the 1890s and after, and, and uh, it looks colonial style, but just blown up, you know, much bigger than houses that were built during the colonial era. That was an effect, actually. That was an effect that they tried to make. It, the, 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 some of the architects, when they described this house, if you can see, you, when you look at the house, it looks like, it, and it is, there's a curve in the, in, the, in the gambrel, all around the edge. You can notice that? And that was, an, that was a technique to, to, to sort of, like the house was like swelling out. Um, it was just a technique that they used. Nice that, nice that you noticed it, because I didn't notice that. It's pretty typical for shingle styles to have that type of, of detailing, but it's nice that you noticed that. All right, let's go to the next one. This house here really is one of the most beautiful colonial revivals. I mean, I hate to single it out over others because there are others that we're going to see tonight that are also quite beautiful. This is a magnificent house. The only problem with this house is it's on a postage stamp size lot because the detailing on this side that you can see clearly when we're walking down here and another even in the back is out is beautiful. It's just outstanding. But you, but the scale of the house doesn't match where it sits but it's a magnificent house. I've been in this house. The spaces on the inside, very spacious, very, very airy, magnificent house inside and out. Look at the detailing, almost like, almost uh, like Victorian amounts of detailing on this house. Look at the urns on the top. That's what these, these on the top of the window dormers here, the swan, they call those swan necks detailing here, the columns with the uh, capitals. It's just a spe spectacular house. The, the huge uh, side lights on the, um, by the door in this house. Big wide hallway when you walk in this. Just a magnificent building. Um, this was designed by a Providence company, um, Angel and Swift, 1896, like most of the houses on the street. There was such a crush for executive housing in this neighborhood um, that all the estates, like in the next block from uh, Arnold to Clinton, that was one house, um, the Hathaway estate was one house. It was a Greek Revival style house like, like RJD, uh, you know, not as, quite as nice as RJD, but that big. It occupied that site, torn down around 1900. And how many houses were built? Beautiful houses, uh, you know, mansion size houses on that block, all around the block. I don't know how many, maybe 10, 12 houses on that side. The same thing with the next block from, from Clinton to Maple. There was one house there, the Jonathan Bourne house. 
That was torn down in 1904. And again, the same thing happened. They, they needed so much uh, land for executive housing that the old a lot of the old estates were torn down and uh, these, de these beautiful developments w replaced what was here before. This is another beauty. Um, Frederick Damon House, again, 1896. This recessed window here, nothing else like that in New Bedford that I know of. Really a very, very unusual um, uh, design. Look at the detailing in the, in, the art, in the archway as well, the recess columns there. A uh, little bit of stained glass, leaded glass. Really, really quite spectacular. Um, it has a nice Palladian window up, at, uh, up on, the, on the balcony as well. Um, Multi-pane glass here. Now, this house has often been attributed to Nat Smith. Um, and I did a lot of work on, on Nat Smith. Um, and I worked with uh, his granddaughter on the project. And she had an inventory of most of, the major, most of the major projects that he did. And this is not one of them. And if this was one of his projects, it would have been on that inventory, because this is a house to be very proud of, actually. Very interesting building. Um, there's been a number of owners of this house, but the latest owners I know did a lot of work rehabbing. It always looked nice. From, my, from the time I was here, the house always looked like it was in good shape. But the, the owners that have owned this house have kept it up quite well on the, on the outside and I think on the inside as well. It's a beautiful building. This is a beautiful house. Again, um, 1895. It actually is sort of a, a, a transition house from the Queen Anne, uh, which is a Victorian style, to the Colonial Revival. But the main reason I wanted to show this house is this very unique feature here. piece of stained glass window in the chimney. Uh, another detail, like the recessed uh, uh, window, a uh, leaded glass window in the Damon house, is this very unusual with the keystone uh, stone decoration around it in the chimney. I mean, come on, you know. The cost, it's a nice feature, beautiful feature, but you know, that it's going to cost so much more <laughs> to do that chimney with that feature. But you know, that's the types of detailing and attention to detail that builders did back then. Um, I'm sure that, I mean, it could have been requested by the owner, unlikely though, I think it was probably something that the builder or the architect thought would be a very nice feature, selling feature perhaps, uh, in, for this particular house. When we go around the front, I just want you to note the beautiful porch. That, that sort of shows that it's, it, it looks like a porch from the Queen Anne style, but there are other details in the house which make it uh, um, uh, more, more like a, a colonial revival as well. It's sort of a transition house. This is the Winchester apartment building, built in the 1920s. 13, there are 13 units, I believe, in this building. It was designed by a man by the name of Oscar Crapo. Now, if you came on the tour last, last uh, month, I talked about the Crapo family, not the same Crapo family. Uh, the Crapo, Oscar Crapo's name, he was French Canadian. Um, and his, his, he anglicized his name from C-R-E-P-E-A-U to Crapo, Crapo to Crapo, same thing basically. Anyway, he was a pretty uh, active architect here in the city during the height of the, of the textile industry, teens, 20s. Of course, all the jobs dried up for architects and almost everybody else during the Great Depression. But he did a lot of um, um, uh, tenements and three-deckers. He had a couple of public buildings as well. And he's one of the few architects that dabbled in Art Deco. Now, this is not an Art Deco building, but this is. <laughs> Big time, um, and if you noticed, at, at, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if he had anything to do with St. John the Baptist Rectory, but there's another one of these on the St. John the Baptist Rectory on County Street. So he may have had, he may have done something, he may have something to do with that building as well, because not too many people, not too many of the architects, dabbled in the Art Deco like uh, Crapo did. I have one of my favorite little buildings in the city is actually a um, comfort station 
in the south end, connected to the south end library, which is now a police station. Comfort Station is right across, right around the block from the, uh, uh, the, the, the police station. It uses this yellow brick as well, and it's, it's, it's been abandoned. But all the Art Deco details are still on the house. I just hope and pray that the city doesn't demolish that, that little building because it's one of the coolest little buildings in the Art Deco style, also designed by Oscar Crapo. This building is in a very popular style in the 1920s for apartments, this do double bay, English style. Um, if you've been, for instance, I used to go to Fenway Park when I was a Red Sox fan a lot. And the buildings right across the street from Boylston Street on, on, in the Fenway look a lot like this, except they're much bigger and so forth. It was a very popular style for apartment buildings. We don't have a lot of this type of apartment building in New Bedford. We're gonna see one at the end of the tour tonight, but this is, a, this is kind of a unique building, very attractive. Um, you can see the beveled glass, again, nice detailing in the glass. I mean, that's not something that's cheap to buy. It's a, it's a, it's a quality glass to have all this beveled glass in the window of the, of the doorway here. Just a nice building. This house um, is a beauty of, you know, look at the detailing, the key, the, key, the dental work and so forth on this particular house. It's a really beautiful example of four square construction in New Bedford. Now the, the four square became very, very popular in New Bedford because of the lot size issue really. They started there's some beautiful ones in this neighborhood, bigger ones and not so not so basic as they as they got when, in, when as the building went west towards uh, Buttonwood Park and Rockdale Avenue. But the four square was a good selection because it fit well because it was square, um, and you could ornament the front like crazy because that's what everybody was going to see. But they, you did recognize basically that you weren't going to see the back and the sides. So there was a lot of so a lot of a lot of the four squares have beautiful ornamentation in, in the front, but not so much in the sides and the back. This, is a, 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 this one has a little bit more ornamentation because it has a little bit more room on either side. Not a lot, but a little bit more. Now, um, look at the beautiful leaded glass again in the doors here. Finney was, um, uh, a, he owned a store, one of the stores. I'm not sure which one. When we go through the big uh, mansion, houses, you know, so all these, you know, we always advertise a whaling captain's house. Ah, the whaling captain's never had that kind of money. <laughs> the big mansions are all done by the merchants. Whaling captains own the smaller houses like this one, say, across the street, you know, something a little more modest because they couldn't afford the, like the big giant mansions that you associate with the whaling industry. And, and surprisingly, a lot of these large houses here, this is one, of, this is an exception here. Almost all the large houses that we saw tonight so far were owned by the merchants that were capitalizing on the tremendous growth and success of the textile industry. The economy, we, we can't even imagine. If you've lived in New Bedford, been around New Bedford most of your life, we just can't imagine the economy that textiles brought to the city. Money was just coming in and leaving in, in huge amounts. And it allowed all these things to be developed during this time. And one of the things was businesses. Um, all the businesses along the, the major business, the commercial streets like Purchase, or Cushion Avenue, Pleasant Street, I mean, they just were booming. And all the, as you, when you look at the buildings downtown, they're all fairly new buildings from the teens and 20s. Uh, all the old buildings that had been there for prior to were, were, had been torn down and replaced. But the Great Depression ended all that, ended all that growth. And that's been good to some degree for us because that means these neighborhoods have been preserved. Because if there was the unbridled growth of New Bedford, like in some cities, a lot of these places would have been torn down for bigger, better houses. That's just how it works. Um, and so, because someone asked on one of the other tours, I said, boy, it's funny how you have so many nice houses in, this, in these areas close to downtown. And that's the reason. Because growth in New Bedford stopped at the Great Depression and really never recovered to the degree that had been ongoing during the years of the textile industry, which ended with the Great Depression in 19, 1929. The next house is this one right here. I'll talk about it from right here because you can see it plainly. This is another beauty. I've been in this house. This has been owned by a nut. This, this house changes hands a lot, but it seems like everybody who buys it keeps it up beautifully. It was on the house tour a couple of times uh, way back. I haven't been in it in a while, but it looks like it's in, still in tip-top shape. And one of the one of the most unbelievably expensive features on this house is the curved glass windows on this house. 
I looked that up. I said, boy, curved glass windows, was that difficult to make? In 1902, when this house was built in 1905, it was extremely difficult to make and very expensive. Um, and you can see there's a bunch of them on this house. And then the house on the corner, I think this is the house on the corner, there's more of them than, than on this house. So, I mean, this was a very, it still is a very expensive feature to build corn, uh, curved glass windows. And you can see how big they are here. Um, they probably, thank God, they never had to replace them because they, they probably couldn't replace them. They, you know, I, I think there are manufacturers, but it cost a fortune to replace those windows. The technology, and the technology in 1900 to build these windows was extremely um, uh, difficult and expensive. So, but this is a beautiful house. This was owned by a, a textile mill man, one of the, one of the leaders of the mills, the, uh, the Gosnold Mill, which is in the south end, the old Howland Place. It was, was, was Howland Place, a Howland Mill for a while, then it became the Gosnold Mill. And the man, his name was Booth. He was the, um, the treasurer or the, or the CEO of uh, the Gosnold Mill during the time he lived in this house. This is such a beautiful house in my view. Um, this is the house that was built by Anna Roach Stone. Anna Roach was one of the, one of the children of William J. Roach, the last, uh, not the last, but the, the, the owner of the Wamsutta John, uh, James Arnold house from uh, uh, 1872 until he died in 1893. He willed the house to his, to his children, uh, most of whom were, were, women, were, were girls. And one of them was Anna Roach Stone. Um, she built this house on the site in 1891. Talk about symmetry here. <laughs> we got symmetry galore, but it's, it's beautifully done. Don't know, unfortunately, I don't know the architect of this particular uh, building, but whoever it was did a beautiful job of detailing the house. It's very reminiscent of, of high-style colonial, sort of, I mean, the detailing is, is, is fairly outlandish for if, if this house would have been built during the colonial period, but it's very close, actually, to what a colonial house would have looked like um, in, you know, in the 1760s, something like that, in, a, in the city uh, an environment, something like that. But you can see that the, um, again, it's this house, I guess they do have, they used to, have, they had this, this slate roof until just recently, but obviously it's a new roof now. Um, just a great house, the columns, the window detailing, the detailing on, on, on the, the set, these sets of four windows with the wreaths and the little pilasters against the wall. Just a lot of detail, beautiful building. Um, not much you can say for, about it. It's a business building now. Um, rich families always lived in the house. The, if anybody remembers the Prescott, Oliver Prescott, very famous lawyer, and his, his family um, were judges in the city as well. Uh, he lived, th that family lived in this house in the um, beginning around, in I think the teens or, or 20s or so, lived in this house for many years. Uh, but it, now it's, um, it's a business. I, I think they do estate planning, stuff like that. Anyway, a lovely house. Roosevelt Apartments. This was a project by the three sisters that I just mentioned. Uh, the three Roach sisters, 1920, early 1920s, um, decided to um, build this building. 73 apartments in this building. Kind of a nice building. Um, colonial colonial style. I mean, there's not a lot of big apartment buildings. There's a few, but not a lot of big apartment buildings like this in New Bedford. I mean, the Winchester's of an apartment building. It only has 13 units. This has 73 units. It's a nice building. Now, the architects of this building were a firm by the name of Leary and Walker. They were both named Frank, Leary and Walker. And I met... Um, Walker's son, his name was Robert Walker, uh, a few years ago. Uh, he, I was working on a project and he, he heard about me and he wanted to give, them, give me a list of the, of the, of the firm's uh, projects. Leary and Walker did the Zyterian, the Normandan uh, High School, this building, um, all sorts of mill buildings, the, from the largest, you know, some bills, bill, large mill buildings to even the smallest little bathroom uh, jobs are listed in this inventory. 500 projects they did in the late teens and 20s. 500 projects. That's a lot of work for an architectural firm, considering that a lot of their buildings were, were, were huge, like this. This has had to be a, a, major, a major job for them. Look at all the drawings they had to do. 70, I don't know how many floors there are here. 
but 73 units, that's a lot of work. So they were very busy during, during that time. Leary and Walker. Their buildings, like even the Zyterian, it's a nice, it's a nice building. It's a nice theater, inside and out. But if anybody remembers the Olympia, um, the Olympia was a grander building by a long shot. And there were other, probably other theaters in New Bedford that were, that were bigger. The, the, the Leary and the, the, the firm was, was, was a good firm, but it wasn't terribly, um, imaginative, really. This, you know, I think this building's, for an apartment building, I think they did a nice job here. But some of the, like, the Zyterian's a little dull considering the, the grand theaters that were built in cities like New Bedford, uh, and Fall River, even, uh, in Providence during that time. But anyway, he did do the Zyterian and, uh, a whole bunch, a huge number of other buildings. Very pretty and prolific firm at the time. That concludes the tour to, for tonight. Um, thank you all for coming. It wasn't that bad heat-wise, right? It was a pretty nice night. Um, thank you.